Consuming. Hey, this is Nomad, host and creator of the Career Musician Podcast. Why do they call me Nomad? Well, I traveled the globe, spreading the joy of music one song at a time. And now I bring you wisdom, tried and true knowledge, and life experiences of my colleagues and peers in this crazy business we call music. On this episode of the Career Musician Podcast, we have Wayne Lindsay. From The Tonight Show to American Idol, this man does it all. This is the Career Musician Podcast with your host, Nomad. Okay, Wayne is one of those guys, when he sits down at the piano, the piano is no longer an instrument. It becomes him. And let me tell you, a lot of people in the biz have recognized this innate ability. Hence, he was scooped up from the moment he set foot in Los Angeles. His resume reads like a who's who encyclopedia. We're talking Miles Davis, Aretha Franklin, Stevie Wonder, Whitney Houston, Kenny Babyface Edmonds, Earth, Wind, and Fire, James Ingram, Leon Ware, Brenda Russell, Shaka Khan. And this was all before he landed American Idol and The Tonight Show with Jay Leno. He's a longtime friend of Ricky Minor, so wherever Ricky and the band goes, Wayne is sure to be in the center of it all. Here today at actually my studio, Nomad's Place, right oh, here yeah. in Burbank, Sunny Burbank, with the one and only Wayne Lindsay, keyboard player, extraordinary, like G. I mean, bro, I don't use the G word. I don't use the genius word, okay? But you, uh, you qualify for well, thank sure. You, Mike. Thank you, I appreciate that. <laughs> Absolutely. So, but man, uh, I'm so glad to have you on the podcast. Mm -hmm. The career musician, you are the epitome of that term. Yeah. And we, you just walked in. We just started talking right away. We yeah. got right into it. Yeah. And then you tell me that you're working on a mentorship program, yeah. which is beautiful. So welcome. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you. Thank you. Glad to be here. I think that it's important that guys understand that, uh, you know, your musical voice is something that God gave only to you. Mm. And with that understanding, you know, should also come the confidence to know that you are the only you there'll ever be. You know what I mean? So therefore, when you meet another guy that, that's talented, you know, you can admire the gift that God gave him without it having any impact on your own. Because it's still, you're still gonna be you. Right. You know what I'm saying? That guy doesn't keep you from being the best you that you are. Because right. he can play circles around you even. You know what I'm saying? Right. You know, it's not the, the attitude to be jealous or to be envious. It's to be, you know, in awe of what, of, of what God has done in another vessel. But see, you said a key phrase. It, let's say another cat can play circles around you, yeah. technically speaking. Yeah. Because at this level, we're all pretty yeah, we, good. Yeah, we are. We are. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Some cats might have more chops than right. others. Right, right. What do you do about that? Because immediately in, in music, for some reason, there's this competitive edge. How do you prevent from Well, like I said, you know, or, when you understand that still, you're still you. And no matter what he does, he'll never bring what I bring. Exactly. That's my point. Exactly. I'm the only, I'm the baddest Wayne Lindsay you're going to ever find. Because <laughs> <laughs> there's only one me. You feel That's me? right. You That's see, right. so that confidence, you know, is what I carry with me, which, you know, keeps me from getting in competition with cats. Right. Because there is no competition. You know what I mean? They're just them and I'm me. And we're different. I love that. You know what I'm saying? And like I said, because of that, I can you know, literally be happy when I see other talent, you know, like, wow, right. you know, I mean, I, you know, I can appreciate it. It, it doesn't diminish me, you know, That's and right. like I say, cause I know I have something to offer too, you know, and if I, even if I wasn't as good as some say I am, you know what I mean? Right, right, right. <laughs> I'd still have my unique qualities. And I find it, and I was refreshing to find it when moving out here or even in Nashville, the, the higher the quality of the musician, yeah, the, the less more ego. humble they are, yeah. the, the less ego. Yeah, because you yeah. understand when you get to a certain level, you know, that we're just vessels. That's right. You know. We sure are. We're, we're vessels, you know. We, we were chosen to be gifted, you know, because cats, some cats really think that it's them. So, you know, when you put it in perspective, then, you know, it's really nothing to get all, <laughs> all egoish about, you know, not personally, 
you know, you know, you still have to work to develop it. If you put in a lot of work, you'll be rewarded. You know, you'll be better than you were. But you know, you know, your, your gift is natural. It came from God. So. Right. I love that. It's yeah. beautiful. Yeah. All right. So, so, so you you hail from kind of D.C. and a little bit of the South, Atlanta. Texas. A lot of the South. Yeah, I okay. was there most of my life. You're moving around. Your dad was a preacher. So. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And then, so at 21, you came out here. Yeah. So what was the you know what brought you out here? Well, interestingly enough, like I said, my dad was a bishop. Okay. Uh, he got elected in 78, which is why we went to D.C. my senior year of high school. Gotcha. And uh, he gave me the option to finish in Atlanta, but I chose to go. Some other stuff went down. I was like, I'm out of here. Yeah. This case, in Christmas of 82, the bishop that was assigned to the California area died suddenly. And they asked my dad to come cover this district suddenly. Wow. So they were talking to me, and I was kind of in New York, and D.C. both okay. making my... You just hustling, gigging. Yeah, I was yeah, working yeah. when I was in Bobby Broom's band. You hit the Bobby? Absolutely. I did his second record. Wow. Yeah, after the Clean Sweep album. And I actually met him in a club in D.C. That's killer. And uh, so I was living with him and Victor Bailey in New York, Dig. working on the second record and yeah. commuting back to, to, to uh, D.C. And uh, then the guy died. And then my parents asked me, well, do you want to move to California with us? And I was like, yeah, I do. Wow. So I came out here kind of cold, you know what I mean? Yeah. Well, uh, just <laughs> just suddenly. <laughs> January 5th, to be exact. Wow. was the day I moved. January, January 5th, 1983. Yeah. Wow. That's well, pretty cool, man. Yeah, it's one of them things you just never forget. You know, it's the fifth day of the yeah. year. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's be, that was the heyday. Yeah. Of pop music, man. Yeah, a lot was going on. We were doing sessions, and you yeah. Know. Tell us about that. So, what, what was that like? Because you hear stories, man. I was doing three sessions a day, six yeah. days a week. Well, you know, you know, I was never that guy. Okay. To the, I mean, there were guys that were working like that, like Paul Jackson Paul and Steuben House, and you know, Still there was yeah, like all that. you know, there were those guys, you know. And I was just a new guy, you know what I mean? Okay. And so I started doing my thing. It's funny, back then, you'd have to go to the Musicians Union on Vine to pick your checks up. Wow. They didn't mail checks. So you'd go stand in line, and they'd have boxes, wow. you know, alphabetized. But then there'd be some guys coming to pick their shit up, man, and you'd just see. <laughs> they'd have rubber bands. I say they need a box. Yeah, you know what I'm saying? Box. They had their own little box, you know, their own little section, you know. And uh, so anyway, it was a real cool scene, you know, because we were still doing a lot of live music, yeah. you know. So I did a lot of sessions back then, like with Lewis Johnson Jr. on bass. Wow. And, uh, you know, Ricky Lawson and uh, Charles Fearing on guitar. So you were doing, like, televised stuff as well, well as records. Well, the, the, my television stuff started a little bit later, but not really that much, you okay. know, because I ended up hooking up with HB, okay. HB Barnum. Who was like the predecessor to Ricky in terms of all the black TV stuff that was going on? So he did like the Black Filmmakers Hall of Fame. He used to do the Image Awards. He was Aretha's director, musical director. That's right. That's so, where I know him from. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So yeah. I worked with Aretha with him too. I was her pianist, you know. Wow. And I started on seconds. But anyway, yeah, I did a bunch of TV shows like the Image Awards. Yeah. For sure, and stuff like that early on. Okay. You know, like I said, the uh, Black Filmmakers Hall of Fame show. The Budweiser, uh, Parade of Stars, Lou Rawls, tell you know, wow. that kind of stuff. All right, so so you man, so you're in it. Like you yeah. came at twenty one years old, but yeah, I'm, I, I, yeah, I started like right away. It's funny too to hear other cats talk about it because you know, to me, it's just my life. But other guys are like, man, I remember when you got here. You know, you were like, you came. Another thing that was interesting about when I got here, I came with a go go swing because I played drums too. You know, oh, wow. so I met like. Uh, the band T's, you know, like Corny Ismims and Chucky Booker and Rex Salas and the Chucky, Oregon yeah. Brothers, all those guys, you know. Wow. And they were playing Minneapolis style, you know. Everything was on the, on the West Coast was kind of following Prince in the time, kind of. Okay. Seven, 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 you know, that was the hum. And I was like, they were like, what is that? You know, so Total I don't swing from yeah. the fast eights and sixties. Yeah, so when I, you know, yeah. so they, they, I definitely remember that. You know, like wow. them, like looking at and saying, you know, what is this dude playing? You yeah. know, but they but, were digging it. Yeah, you know, and then eventually, you know, all you know, uh, doing the butt and all that stuff came later, and everybody right. got exposed to go go. Right, but <clears throat> and Chucky really uh, 
uh, brought that. Do you, what, is he the one that brought it to fruition? Or? Chuck, you booking? Yeah, yeah. No, not no, Go-Go. No, no. Oh, you're about Chuck Brown. Chuck Brown, sorry. Yeah, Chuck Brown. Well, Chuck Brown is the godfather right. of Go-Go. But, right. but uh, his record, the one he had that came out my senior high school, was... was uh, uh, his biggest song. What was Chuck Brown? I busted like loose. loose. Right, busted loose. loose. I love that. Right, tune. so that was like the first kind of <laughs> national hit. But like I say, yeah. then later on, the EU came out with doing the butt. Gotcha. And that okay. kind of like okay. swamped it as far as like everybody getting hip to that go go on another right. level. Right. But yeah, everybody you know knows Chuck's the Godfather. You yeah, know, yeah, he's yeah. definitely rest his soul. You know. All right, so so what was your studio experience like? Let's talk about like the, the deep records that you played on. You had that played on some big cuts, some big records. Yeah. When you're young, in your early twenties, it had to be a little, uh, you know, intimidating at first. Or do you feel like you were already prepared for it from all your other experiences? Well, I mean, the only thing I really had to get prepared for was the red light. Okay. You know what I'm saying? Because yeah. initially, for me, you know. The red light was my intimidator. Yeah. Just knowing, okay, they're recording it's now. It's in red now. You gotta, you gotta be right. You know, you gotta play perfect. You know what I mean? Yeah. So to be able to play your best and and stay in a in a, in a creative, productive mode, right? And knowing that you're being recorded was something that I had to get used to. But it right. didn't take that long, you know. Yeah. It was just that initially, like I said, it was taped too. You know what I mean? It yeah, wasn't yeah. no digital, and all that. You know. It's a lot more expensive. Yeah. You know time, what I mean? Right? Everything. You know. <laughs> And you know you got a whole band playing with it. You know. You I was saying, like, what's the most members of a, of a you know an ensemble that you've performed or recorded with actually? Well, I mean, normally speaking, I mean we still did it. You know, rhythm section. Okay. You know, we didn't yeah. bring in strings and play live. That was know. overdub stuff. Yeah, yeah always. Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean. So generally, it was you know kind of you know one one experience. You know, James Ingram's record. I did his last Warner Brothers record. That might have been ninety three or ninety two or so. But that record we did uh, with one rhythm section, the whole record. Right. And we went to the studio and stayed about a month at Ocean Way and just cut the whole album, now, which was cool. We did the same thing with Kenny's Christmas album, too, though. Wow. Yeah, we cut his album with the same rhythm Baby section. Face, wow. yeah. Now, yeah. Well, when you go in with a section like that, the camaraderie is so strong. Talk about that, man. I mean, that... Well, that, I mean, it can be. What, what do you think? It depends. You, I mean, yeah. you know, cats are strange. You know, cats okay. are who they are, and you never know who they are and how they are. Okay. So in those instances, a lot of times, you know, it's just kind of is what it is. You know, music, I mean, yeah. well, in my case, you know, I know all these guys, and so we already have relationships, and I'm closer to some than I am others, period. Right. Sure, sure, sure. You know, now, we all get along. Right. You know what I mean? But... You know, when you say camaraderie, I mean, you know, that's those are diehards. You know what right, I mean? Right, I'm right, thinking, right, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. So here, it's just it's 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 work with guys you love and respect. You know what okay. I mean? And like I say, you're happy to see some of them than you others. And, <laughs> you know, all of them are great yeah. players, but yeah. you know, everybody doesn't have the same attitude. You know, right. and you know, then I know I'm a different guy. You know, I'm not LA. You know what I'm saying? Right. I don't, I'm not in, into the ass kissing. I'm not yeah. into a lot of what comes with LA. I believed that if I were to intentionally change my personality, it would have a profound effect on my music. Mm. I wouldn't be the player, because I'm an aggressive player, but I'm also yeah. an aggressive person. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. but if you know me, then you know I got a great heart. Let's talk about this, man, because this is the perfect segue. Uh -huh. Networking is a huge part of what we do. Right. And there's, there's different approaches, and I like your approach, because your approach is, I'm just gonna be me, I'm not going to ask Kiss. I'm not going to go chase certain things. I'm going to see if I can make an opportunity with somebody. Right. If they don't reciprocate, if they're not open, then that's it. I'm done. I'm not going to go chase them down. Right. So, but then there is the other side of that where it's like, no, nah, man, you got you to gotta work those relationships. You got to cultivate them. You got to do the follow-ups. You got to do this. You got to be seen in all the right places. You know, that gets exhausting, bro. Yeah. But so what would you say to the next generation of people coming up? How do you how do you navigate that? You know, it's a part of it. You got to network. You know, you can't be an island. Right. Like I said, you know, I think that you know, as a man, as a as a person, as a human being, you know, uh, I believe in authenticity. That's right. You know what yeah. I mean. And so, if you're not coming from a place of authenticity, then 
I really don't want to hear what you got to say anyway, musically. I love, <laughs> you know, you yeah, know I love I mean? it. I love it, man. So speaking of those studio days, so you 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 hold up in a studio for yeah. a month, yeah. working on Ingram's, right? Yeah. A lot of people, I think, especially the, the less experienced musicians coming up, don't really understand studio etiquette. Yeah. So let's talk about the hierarchy. Yeah. You have an executive producer who's paying for everything. Right. They're usually attached to the label, right? Then yeah. you have A and R, who's yeah. kind of coaching the artist on direction. Yeah. Then you have the producer of the album, right? Right. Uh -huh. Then you have your first engineer, your second engineer. Of course, you have your band. You might have a music director in the in the in the tracking room. You might not. No, it's usually the producer. It's the producer. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah. So, studio etiquette. Let's talk about that, and what's your take on that? Be well, I mean, it, it depends. You know? It it all depends on the setting. Yeah. You know what I mean? Because a lot of times, a lot of the producers really don't know what they want. That's right. So they're calling you in for everything that you bring, which is your voice as well as your music. So sometimes you're going to have... That's the ideal situation. Yeah. That's a good well, I mean, well, right. you know, well, one thing I, I, I had to, you know, tell one of my friends early on who uh, had moved here and I tried to throw him a bone and say, yo, man, come play guitar on this little demo I'm doing just to, you know, yeah. get his feet wet. Yeah. I'm just looking at and him. he got really upset because I, I touched one of his knobs on his pedals. Trying, to, <laughs> <laughs> I was just trying to see if I can get it to sound a different way. You know, he got yeah. really offended, but he didn't tell me until later. He called me and he cussed me out. But basically, he was saying that's my sound and this and that and this and that. And I was like, well, you know what though, this ain't your record. Uh -huh. So the first thing you got to do is is lose the the, the personal attachment to your performance. Mm -hmm. You know, your job is to make the producer and the artist happy. That's right. So you don't have to like it. As long as it's what they want, then just give it to them. You know what I mean? So, so that's important, you know, to, yeah. to, to create that detachment and, and, and not look at every session like it's your personal album. That's the perfect articulation. you got to detach from it. Right. You can't be protective. It's, it's not your song. It's not your song. It's not yeah. your record. It's, yeah. You know, your job is to give them what they want. And you need to be working to try to make that happen and make them happy. Number one, I love that. You feel me? I love so, that. you know, other than that, you know, when you're in sessions, when you got a whole lot of people, like I said, the, the dynamics vary. So it's mm -hmm. good to read the situation mm -hmm. and see, you know, who's, you know, trying to step up and keep it going. Sometimes the producer knows more than others. I mean, you know, you might be in a situation like James's record, for example. Tom Bell is a producer. So Tom is, you know, he's, you know, legendary. You yeah. know what I mean? He yeah. knows what he wants. Yeah. You know, so... I mean, as far as the etiquette is concerned, I mean, the the you know, the, the main thing is, is is punctuality and being prepared. You know what I mean? Having your stuff work and knowing your way around your gear and being able to give them what they want. Uh, you know, being on time is, is is everything. You know what I mean? And the youngsters don't get that. You know, and also just in general. I mean, like. Even today, you know, me coming here, you know, this is us hanging. But yeah. I told you I was going to be at a certain time. So it was important to me to show up before then. You were 15 minutes early, and I, yeah, loved, you I know was out there waiting. And right. I just knew. I knew, well, he's going to be here, you know. Yeah. And, and we have that, yeah. that understanding. Yeah, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. And, and I haven't always been this way, you know what yeah. I mean? Dude, I'm, I'm old to you now, so yeah. I, I know more than <laughs> I used to. Yeah. But that's important. Yeah, and it's is. important to operate like that in everything you're doing. Okay, if you can't show up on time for this little hundred dollar gig, I'm not calling you on this big gig. You see, and you need Great. to treat every gig, if you commit to it, with the same importance. You know, you don't treat it like, oh, it's only seventy five dollars, so I'm gonna show up and give them seventy five dollars worth of me. That's you know, right. you don't do that, in right. my opinion. You know, no, I believe if you thing. if you say you're gonna do it, then you just don't. show up and you do what's got to be done to make it work. You know, and then yeah. negotiate better next time. We'll say no. You know, but you can't go up, come in, giving half and thinking it's okay to be late or those kinds of things. And then expect, you know, the the call next time when it's the, when the, when, the, when it's big money because I'm not going to pass you along. That's right. Yeah. But that's in general. So that's like beyond studio. Like, this is just gig editing. This is just yeah, exactly. career musician Exactly. Editing, right? Same thing. Wherever you happen to be. If, you, if you're working, then, you know, then. And then, you know, I've run into situations where cats, you know, uh, this one kid, his mom is famous. And she and I were really close. And uh, I was trying to work him into her music. Oh, you know, yeah. so, so I said, here, well, program these drums for me. You know, we have to play in a couple of days, you know. Right. Give me a, a four-bar drum loop, you know. And so I told him, left him, you know, four days later or whatever. Uh -huh. We're leaving. I, I stopped by. I'm like, yo, you got the loop for me? 
oh, uh, uh, you didn't say when you needed it. Oh. I, was, I was like, yo, man. I was like, anything you didn't know, you should have asked. <laughs> you feel me? So, you know, I mean, the moral of that story is find out what you need to know about a gig, you know. If you know, if you don't know Ask when the project the is due, then find out when the project is due. You know? That's good. Do you ever feel uh quote unquote funny about asking too many questions? Or you just say, No man, just let me let me get it all out. Well, just know everything. well it depends. I mean me, I have to like mute my questions because a lot of times, you know, <laughs> my mind runs fast. So I I've done I, the I, same I get thing, stuff yeah. quick. So sometimes yeah. I ask questions. Just to bring clarity to the band. Right. Okay. I already know the answer, but That's I'm nice. like, I feel this is unclear. So I'll ask the question to try to put it out there. So then, you're bridging the gap for everybody? Sometimes, but then they only, a lot of times people don't even want to hear it, you know what I mean? Yeah, so, yeah. I mean, like I said, it depends, you know. Yeah. Sometimes it's just like, okay, y'all on your own, you know. That's good. And then, uh, so it depends, you know what I mean? Like I said, you know, I guess the main thing is, you know, being aware. Right. right. Uh, you know, and reading the room. It's probably not spoken about enough or not understood enough of just what it takes to be, to put yourself out there. You know what I'm saying? Like when you say, when you say, okay, like me, you know, I'm releasing this record of my songs that that I wrote for the whole world to criticize and jump up and down on, you know, and thumbs down on, you know what I mean? That's, that's, you have to, you know, you have to be up to that. I'm glad you said that. Let's talk about this, man, because, yeah. look, I think, mm-hmm. I believe that there's a certain time in a side, we call a side man, right? A side man's right. career that we say, you know what, fuck this, I'm over being everybody else's, right. dude, I'm right. going to be my own thing, right. Right? right? right. Sounds like that's what, you're working on your own thing. Well, I mean, because I was, I, was, I was signed a version in, in 90, 1989, so I had a record deal all the way back then, so this is a new for me. Okay. So you know what I mean? Do, but so it is... But it, it is still something that you always have to deal with, you know, yes. when you when you are an artist. Even though I'm not a well-known artist, yeah. I am an artist, you know right. what I mean? So I understand that. How and, do you deal with the people that hire you all the time who might, you don't know for sure, but you just feel like they might be looking down, you know, oh, whatever, he's an artist now, whatever. Well, you know what I mean? Well, like, see, I don't, you, I, don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't get into any of that. Yeah, okay. None of that matters to me. Okay, you know good, what I'm saying? Good. It doesn't matter because I know who I am, and that's what I'm saying. You start there. You know, you have to have the confidence to know that you belong wherever you are. You know, and if you don't think you belong, then don't go. You know, that's another uh, other advice I tell youngsters. Don't put yourself in situations that you're going to be unsuccessful. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Uh, if you know you can't read, don't take a reading gig. Tell some, give That's it to right. your buddy. You know what I mean? Because that could be do more detriment. That's to you right. Than, you, you see what I'm saying? Uh, so just because you, you know, I don't want to miss the opportunity. No, you do want to miss the opportunity because yeah. you only get one chance to go in and make a first impression. So don't go in there and let them people see you embarrass yourself like that. Just say just to pass, you know. But aside from that, again, you know, like I said, I know who I am regardless of who. You know, when I play with Herbie, I'm yeah. confident to play next to Herbie. You know what I'm saying? I'm not Herbie. Yeah, but, but I know I'm Wayne, exactly. and I'm comf- I'm I'm comfortable, and I can I play you know f- freely with him or Stevie or whoever it is, you know what I'm saying? Because I'm me, and and I and I believe in me. You see what I mean? <laughs> so therefore, you know, it don't matter to me, you know, that you done sold a million records and you don't know who I am or what I've done or or, or whatever. It don't matter to me. Right. <laughs> but you have that internal confidence. Yeah, and that's what that's that's what I think we all need. I was saying to somebody not too long ago, just trying to explain to them, you know, the confidence that it takes, you know, for example, to be the pianist on American Idol. Yes. You understand? All ears, please talk about it. Right, we're playing live, out to the world. Yes. You know what I'm saying? You got one chance, and and all these kids are coming up with their big songs, this their big moment, it's their time. And and, and, And you get the cue in your ear, and the only thing they're waiting on is to hear you go, you know. They're just waiting on that. They're just waiting on your intro, you know, or whatever it is, you know what I'm saying? It's just you and space. You can't fuck it up. You know, I mean, you could, but you can't. That would be (laughs) awesome. You feel me? (laughs) That's my point. You know what I mean? You're going to be the one to mess up their chance on TV because when you mess up their intro, then they're going to sing bad. And then they're going to go to the producers and complain about the piano player who messed up their song. You know what I mean? That's a lot of weight. You know what I mean? So, I mean, you got to have big balls to sit in that chair and go week 
after week, song after song, song, after song. intro after intro, with just you and because a, a lot of I mean every song of course is not piano and voice, right? You know, but I'm saying so many times it falls on you to carry that song, especially the first verse or whatever. You feel me? And right. so if you're not comfortable in your or confident in your abilities and mm -hmm. and prepared, mm -hmm. then you're gonna be the guy up there, you know. Is there somebody else you can call in that chair? We know we need somebody that we can, that we know. That's right. Is, that's going to be able to deliver under pressure. As soon as the show is over that day, that's exactly what will happen. Yeah. And you won't even know it. Exactly. You'll just exactly. get pulled aside later and say, right. listen, don't come back tomorrow. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Or you'll get an email or a phone so call. All that yeah. stuff happens. <laughs> yeah. You know. Talk, bro, talk about that. That's so amazing. Yeah. The live TV experience, because now you've been doing it for a while. How long have you been in that? <laughs> well... Chair, but you were on and off, right? In that well, I did chair. the first three years. Right. No, I did the first year. Okay. 2005. That's the year we came in. Yeah. And then Ricky and I didn't speak for three years. Oh shoot. And okay. then 2009 we started speaking and working together again. Okay. So I came back in the band when we were going to Leno, which was perfect timing for me, and uh, it worked out. That's you know. beautiful, man. It's just truth, and I we need more musicians. Who just speak yeah. truth about everything. Yeah, well, that's, you know, like I said, I, I don't feel as though God, you know, spared me to run around and keep it a secret. And keep your mouth shut. You know what I'm saying? Because people need to know, first of all, you know, the, you know, my, my key word in life is, for me, is, 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 is restoration. So that's what happened in my case. Wow. You know, so September 4th of last year, I celebrated 10 years of no cocaine. Dude, you know, I, I congratulations, was, you know, yeah, brother. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, man. You know what I mean? So that was yes, a blessing, sir. you know, to come through that whole thing and then be able to get my career and my life back. Back on track. Yeah, because that was a, a major That's... setback to all that whole time, you know, of me, you know, being in that mode. Okay. You okay. Know. Yeah. But, uh, you know, like I said, I was able to survive it. That transparency is what people need to hear because maybe there's somebody out there struggling. Yeah. And they hear your story. Yeah. Like you said, you got to share the good and the bad, exactly. everything in between. Yeah. Yeah. One of the things that struck me really cool about Wayne is when I first moved here back in 2005 to LA, he was extremely helpful and gave me advice that I'll never forget. I just got to town and I'm like, Wayne, I don't know what to do, man. I got offered a tour, you know, but I moved here to do sessions and get more into film and TV music. Should I go on the road or should I, you know, just stay here and cultivate that? He's like, man, is the tour paying you? I said, yeah. He goes, well, why are you asking me then? Go make the money, bro. <laughs> so, you know, sometimes things seem so obvious, but for some reason, we can't quite put our finger on it. And every once in a while, you need somebody, uh, you know, with the experience and whom you look up to, to help you out. And Wayne did just that for me. And let's not forget to help one another and encourage one another as we all navigate the course of this crazy business we call music. Add the career musician to your playlist. All right, dude, that's amazing. So, but getting back to TV, uh -huh. we got to talk about this yeah. American Idol, Jay Leno, mm -hmm. and then now you do every TV show with yeah. Ricky because Ricky's doing every freaking TV yeah, show. Yeah, we just did the Oscars, which he was did the Oscars. He which, told me about. Yeah, that was crazy. That's me. <laughs> I interviewed him for the podcast did just you? before you guys did it. Uh huh. Nice. Yeah, yeah. So nice. I have his episode ready to go. Oh. So, so, so talk about the TV process at this level, bro. Because look. Hands down, this is the highest level you can get to yeah. as a quote-unquote career musician, a professional yeah. musician. Yeah. Live TV for the biggest shows on earth. Yeah, yeah. Right? Yeah. So talk about that. What's that like? <laughs> talk about a day at the studio, the TV studio. Well, the first thing, you know, is that, you know, the youngsters, you know, y'all need to be reading music. You know, so start and, and start, start reading young. music, being prepared. I mean... You know, and it's interesting too, we're talking about the career musician. I mean, right. some people, they feel as though their talent is, is such, you know, like a baby face who doesn't read and who's successful. Yeah. There's tons of people that are successful who don't read. Right. So it can be done. But if you, we're talking now, career musician. That's right. Not you see, being artists. Yeah, we're right. not talking exactly. about that. You know what I mean? If you want to be exactly. a guy that can make a living in this business working as a musician. That's right. You know, then you need to be able to do as many of the gigs that come your way as possible. Yes. So, uh, day in the studio, for example, on the Oscars, you know what I mean? We yeah. go in, we have two days of pre-record, and there's no, you know, we there is no rehearsal, we're recording. You know, we run it once, and then we 
we tape it, or we might not even run it. We might have tape rolling the first time we play it. As you're reading it you know, down. Right. You know, but you need, right. and, you know, it's about discipline. It's about preparation. You know, for the Oscars, we had a serious drop box, which was what we use now all the time. Right. You know, in the early days, you know, Ricky used to FedEx CDs to people. Wow. Yeah. That wasn't a drop box, you know. Yeah, yeah. And then I turned them on the iDisc. Right. Which was the first drop drop box. Yeah, that was before that was drop, from right. from iCloud from Mac, right. Macintosh. Mac, yeah. So I got him an actual an iDisc account and told him, "Look, Ricky, we can do it this way." So yeah. we started using that. Beautiful. Prior to Dropbox, but now everybody uses Dropbox. We have yeah. a big folder for all the shows we do with Ricky, where all the music is up in advance, MP3s, right. edits, charts as soon as they're available, so you can do your homework. But on a show like the Oscars. You know, for the pre-records, we have to record all the theme songs for everybody nominated. Mm -hmm. So we don't know who's going to win. So you have to record them all? All. You know what I'm saying? So that's every category. That's five the different themes or so, whatever, how many are, that are nominated. Wow. So we do pre-records on those. Okay. So therefore, when the show runs, then they already have them on a pad, and the guy in the back, he can just choose the one that won. So we don't have to be like, oh, so and so won. That's chart number five. Go find the music and what you would need, you know. Can you imagine that's it's virtually yeah. Yeah, impossible. impossible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So anyway, so that's what the pre-record sessions are like. We okay. do that. We might pre-record the theme and stuff like that. You know, okay. to give them things that they can use in and out of commercials without having to rely on us playing live. Then there are two lot full days in the studio. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Now, in a case like this with the Oscars, that is the full band orchestra. Everybody's there. Everybody. All. 40 or 5 or however big the orchestra was this year, you know, with strings and horns and the whole nine, so three percussions. Sound stage. Yeah, with Capitol Studios, you know, stretched all out, through, you know. And so that's how that works. So let's talk about the timing, the pacing. One thing I really love about working with Ricky is he doesn't waste time. Right. Like you said, so the first protocol is you show up, you better be, we always say, on time is early. Right. Right? right. On, and actually, if you're right on time, you're late. But if right. you're early, you're on time. Exactly. Number one. Mm -hmm. But then let's talk about the pace of the day. So yeah. downbeat starts 9 a.m., 10 a.m.? It all depends. A and then, but what you, what do you do before downbeat? To, you get prepared, you're like, yo, I got my zone. What do you, what's your zone? You coffee? Do you care? Do you have yeah, a routine? Yeah, I mean, I, what do you I, do? I, I normally, on work days, I always stop by Starbucks and okay. I ride in with a caramel macchiato, you know. But yeah. early, though. You're yeah, oh, oh, yeah. I'm just saying on the way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, if we have, like, if we're doing... A 12 o'clock downbeat, then I'm going to show up around 11, 15, 11, okay. 30 at the latest. Latest, right. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Depending on where we're going yeah. and what we have to do, you know. But you have to use your own judgment to make time for traffic and all that. Yeah, stuff. yeah, yeah. See? Oh, for sure. It's like, yeah. I hate to even say this, but you have to say Yeah, well, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. You know, what you, like I said, you want to be there a good 15. And you have to give yourself time for that's everything right. that's going to come up. Like, especially when you're doing award shows and stuff, because you got to deal with security a lot of times. You know they got to check your bags. You might have to yeah. you might have to check it and get laminated. Get in the building. You know, yep. you know, yep. all that stuff has to happen. So you know you have to park. You don't know what your parking's going to be. That's right. You know how far it is from the venue. So you got to give yourself plenty of time. There's a lot of unknown variables. In exactly. Our job, yeah. Right? Yeah. So Game you want to be ready, session, session. Yeah. and you know, and then make sure your stuff is right and ready to go. Yeah. And then you can relax. You know. Right. And just wait. Until do you have a tech on hand when you do those kind of shows, or you just have somebody help you set it well, up? Well, we have a uh, center stage and yeah. provides backline help for us. So we have a crew of techs right. that we all share. Okay. Now, when I'm touring, then I have my own tech jump. Of course. Depending on what the tour is, you know. Right. Sometimes, you know, you might end up sharing a tech, you know. Sure, sure. But like Whitney, we had our own techs. All right, let's talk about that. Yeah. Yeah, that was... Man, yeah. I mean, that... Talking about like the opportunity of a lifetime. Yeah, that was incredible. Ricky and I, Ricky was really, really fortunate to fall into Whitney's career from the beginning. You know, he ended up putting together a band that played her showcase here in LA. You know, he had met John, her former musical director, her church choir director, because he used to play with Stephanie Mills. Mm -hmm. They did a gig in Boston when Ricky was with Lou Ross, and they played across the street from each other. And so one of the guys in Lou's band knew Stephanie Mills's band, and they all met. And so then John called Ricky and said, this girl at my church has a showcase. Can you help me? You know what I mean? <laughs> so Imagine that's so right, organic. Man. Right. So Ricky was with Lou Rawls, and then, yeah. you know, long story short, he ended up, Whitney, 
she did the first part of her first tour, Ricky wasn't in the band, and then she asked them to get Ricky, and Ricky came into the band. Right. Then John died of AIDS, mm -hmm. John Simmons, and they were going to hire Whitney's mother's musical director to be the musical director, and Ricky told them that he thought that he was more qualified because he was in the band and that they should give him an opportunity. And if they didn't like it, then they could they let the girl have go it. Go with the other, yeah. And so they, they went for it. Mm -hmm. So basically, that's the answer to the question. Ricky brought me into the band in 89 when he took over as musical director. We didn't audition, nothing. He just put together a, a dossier basically on who he wanted to hire. And it was me on keyboards, uh, Kirk Whalen. Kirk, I was the sister. Right, and Ricky Lawson on drums, and brought Ray Fuller on guitar. And yeah. All of us basically walked in yeah. in 89. So anyway, that's when I started with Whitney. It was a long stint, though. Right? Yeah, well, I actually quit not too long after because I got signed to Virgin. Gotcha. And I did okay. that record. You did? Okay. And so then... Was, I was that like, did you tour for that record, too, on your I own? was going to, I planned to, but the record, the company didn't support us. You know what I mean? So the record was doing okay, and, yeah. but they weren't. My plan was to tour with Whitney and, and promote the record in the cities as I go. Yeah, yeah. The record company was like, well, if you don't, nobody's going to talk to you while Whitney's around. So they made me quit. Then, when Version dropped us, Ricky brought me back. Oh. It was your gig, you know? See, look how beautiful that is. Yeah, See, that was that's beautiful. A, that's an unspoken like, yeah. code, right? Yeah. yeah. So anyway, I came back for the Bodyguard tour, and okay. I was there until I left. Uh, in 97 to do Babyface on MTV Unplugged. Yeah, that's where that's we're building up. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> if you've ever wanted to learn guitar the easy way, then jamplay.com is the place to do it. With over 100 teachers and 400 plus courses all on demand at the disposal of your fingertips, Jamplay.com is amazing. And here's the best part. Use coupon code NOMAD to get 30 days free membership. That's right. Use coupon code NOMAD when you're signing up and you will get 30 days free membership to check it out. I myself taught four courses on Jamplay.com. Funk and R&B guitar, modal magic, acoustic pop, and how to craft a cool guitar solo. If you want to learn how to play guitar, or if you know somebody who wants to learn how to play guitar, send them to jamplay.com and use coupon code NOMAD for 30-day free membership access. All right, all right yeah. so, so, so you do the world tour, the body girl, bodyguard world tour. Talking about, bro, you've done you, tour, sessions, yeah. Gates, whatever, tour, everything at the highest level. Yeah. What was that like, doing a world oh, tour at the highest level? It was fantastic. We were on the road 18 months out of two years, oh. I mean, and she was hot. I mean, so we were doing everything, you know, the World Cup, you name it, you know. And, uh, you know, she treated us so good. Right. You know, I mean, we stayed in the best hotels, you yeah. know. We flew business class, you know. They wow. sent limos to the house to get you and bring you home on the tour, you know. Wow. So, matter of fact, you know, I had my own company that I had hooked up with that was on call to drive me, because we lived in Phillips Ranch, Pomona. Matter of fact, Ricky and I both lived out there. We I, were, I we were neighbors. Yeah, yeah, you came out there? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 So anyway, I'd have a car, you know, my own company. I'd just call her, like, yeah, it's time for me to go to the airport. Yeah. She could take me to the airport and pick me up after the tour, and, yeah. you know, and just build a company. It was just great, you know. It's just amazing. And, and, you know, we were a big family. Whitney was cool. You know, I was going to say another thing that changed was that there were snakes inside the camp that were selling information to the tabloids. And that once you know that people who you consider to be family are betraying you like that, then it changes your whole comfort zone, you know, then as you far as in the camp. So yeah. now all of a sudden they don't want us taking pictures. Or I mean, it just changed our, old, our dynamics, you know what I mean? Ooh. But yeah, Whitney was the best, you know what I mean? I just used to love just playing for her between songs, you know, where she wants to talk and I just, I just follow her. Now, yeah. You know, which is another, I wanted to do her funeral too, which I did. I played her the funeral because I wanted to have control over that spirit, you know. That's beautiful. Of just the flow of the service. And, and that's the, the church. Yeah. And of course, you know, like I was there when she died, you know, and we had just seen her Thursday, you know, because we play Clive's party every year. And then that Saturday, we would, had sound checks, so we had been there all day. And uh, 
I was waiting for Jamie Foxx to come and rehearse. They were going to add him to the show. Right. So I was in one of the suites waiting on Ricky and Jamie. And Ricky came in the room. Because nobody was there. It was 4 o'clock and Jamie wasn't there. Ricky wasn't there. And then Ricky came in eventually and told me that she had passed. And I just, when she was upstairs, I was like, oh my God, you know. Wow. So yeah, so anyway, I was saying earlier what I mentioned is that the day after that, I did the Grammys with Jennifer Hudson and they added her and she sang, I Will Always Love You. That must have been. It was one of the, man. Come on, man. How did you see through the tears to the piano? Well, I mean, gosh, well, man, that's like. We had a run through and the sound check is when, I, when it hit me. And I mean, I cried, you know, I mean, it was just surreal to be playing that song for somebody other than her. Yeah. And, uh, man, I'm so, getting goosebumps. Just yeah, it was crazy. Story, just the two man. of us, no band, no nothing, just oh, all piano geez. and vocals. And, uh, so then by the time we did it that night on the show, then I was in professional mode. I just tuned out okay. the significance, the weight, the personal connection to it, and then I just performed. You have to. At that That's point. what you were talking about yeah, earlier. You know what I mean? So that I red just light is yeah, on, yeah. I went for it like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But like I said, that sound check though, the first time when we did it, yeah, yeah, then yeah. it was just a lot. Her not being here and, Yeah. You know, the whole nature of how much focus and attention is put on her lifestyle and and not her music, you know, but then again, you know, people don't understand, you know, like I said, that's why I talk about my life mm. and uh, in terms of, you know, my history with, with drugs and mm. what it cost me and, 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 and the understanding that that's not who you are, that's not your definition. Mm. And in Whitney's case, you know, her drug use is not her definition. No. That was her obstacle. You know what I mean? Her definition is one of the greatest singers ever to grace the planet. That's a period. You know, and that needs to be the focal point when we remember her and when we talk about her. And that's why, you know, like I've done a lot of interviews uh, about her just to make sure that there's a positive voice in the midst of the negativity. Some of the interviews I've done, they haven't really used me because I wasn't willing to go and talk about all the stuff that they want to talk about. They want to know about the, yeah, the yeah, darkness yeah. and stuff like that. Well, first of all, we're all susceptible. Yeah. All, all yeah. of us. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then I always like to say, take the average person, give them fame and fortune, almost yeah. instantly. Yeah. Let's see how you handle it. Yeah. It's not well, like easy. I said, it's a lot of pressure. It's, it's a lot easy. of pressure. Like I said, being yeah. an artist in general. Yeah, and when then you're you out there outside, and you got all these people that are waiting to talk about how you ain't this and how, how you ain't that. You down. That's right. And they did it a lot in her case. You know That's what right. I mean? They That's talked right. about how she wasn't black enough and, oh, you know, they booed yeah. her at the BET Awards or something like that. You know what I mean? She yeah. went through a whole lot. So, wow, Wayne, you've, you've really experienced so much. Yeah. And yeah. <laughs> I yeah. just love your humility, man. Yeah. And, you know, and music, like you said, your gift has kind of been the platform for yeah. you to do this. Yeah, it has, you know? without question. I have to say, being a New Yorker, East Coaster, Cuban, Italian, straight up, no bullshitter. <laughs> I love Wayne's M.O. You know, he's not going to beat around the bush. He's going to tell you the way it is. And I really appreciate that. Sometimes we do have to be more diplomatic, and I'm not to, that's not to say that he doesn't have diplomacy, because obviously he does. He wouldn't have gotten as far in the biz if he didn't. But there are times when you can actually speak your mind and be direct. Say, hey, this isn't working for these reasons, X, Y, Z, or whatever it may be. Music is interesting because it's both an intrapersonal and interpersonal experience. So we have to be sure that we're always thinking of the people around us and that are involved either in the band performance or in the production project overall. And if there's anyone who has a really good handle on these different experiences, it's most certainly Wayne Lindsay. Follow The Career Musician on Facebook and Instagram to stay up to date on the latest news and tips from the world's leading musicians. All right, so I gotta ask. So a lot of people know I'm the, now the music director for a baby face. Right, right, right. <laughs> so, but that was an evolution as well. I've yeah. been with him since uh, 2007. I started as a guitar player and then later became MD. Uh -huh. What was the, when did you start, so you ended with me and then you started with Kenny? I started with Kenny in 97. I actually, I left her 
we had done a, a, a tribute to Babyface on the Grammys okay. for Waiting to Excel. Okay. And we were the house band, and we played for all these artists singing his songs. And he heard me playing his music. And he approached me soon after and was like, hey, I want you to do to work with me. Yeah, yeah. I'm like, I'm down. And so I did some TV shows with him first. We did like Good Morning America, and we okay. did the song uh, Every Time I Close My Eyes. Right, some promo stuff. Yeah, for, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. And then uh, he started calling me to do his records and play yeah. in the studio and do that MTV Unplugged, which was great. And uh, so you did the yeah. MTV Unplugged. Yeah. I mean, wow. That, was, come on. That was Talk about uh, that. Oh, man. That That's was, you and that, Nathan and Nathan Ricky. Nathan East, and, Ricky Lawson, and Sheila E. Yeah, we so taped it in New York, but we rehearsed here. And we went to rehearsal for like six weeks. I would say, how long? Uh, six weeks. It was, come on, yeah. man. That was... It was crazy. Yeah, so I was like, you know, my whole thing when I came in, I was like, well, we need charts. You know, we should get the music printed. And so I got Kenny to get us charts. You did? Good. Yeah, but then Bo didn't read, so Bo was like not following the charts. So, but I was like, you know, it just makes it easier and it's better to have this stuff documented. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, if I have any criticism of that whole process, I think we like beat it to death. I mean, we had, we were so good and so we were so tight. And then we were running it two and three times a day. And it's just like, it just you know, it wasn't fresh like it had been. Right. You know what I mean? Right. But the drag was that when we actually recorded the doggone thing, we went to this theater. Uh -huh. And they thought aesthetically it would be cool to have us play, not on the stage end of the room, but under this parabolic. Sonically speaking, it was a nightmare. So we had no intimacy to our sound. Oh, dude. The whole thing was and just... And to go from a rehearsal studio where, where it was tight, everything tight, was and tight. And you go to... And so that whole thing was like, we'd do a hit, we'd go pop, and it would go... And it just bounced you know, back and forth. It just bounced. And so, I mean, so, you know, when I remember that performance, it doesn't feel like, oh, that was such a great day. So I don't know what happened or how it ended up that way, but... You know, there's always there's always trials and obstacles. Yeah, who knows? But I mean, it's still a great record. Yeah, and it's it and, and it's, it's funny. It's a it's a it's a, it's a classic historical now. piece. Yeah, it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you know, and then after that, then Kenny asked me to go on the road with him, so I started okay. touring with him. And then we did Japan. You and, did the Japan run. Yeah. And to this day, first of all, he loves you. He still talks uh -huh. about he? you with <laughs> such glee, like he gets so excited. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And then he like impersonates you on Does the piano. He? It's what? Because <laughs> <that's, that's laughs> awesome. he just like bangs the notes. He's like. Bloop, 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 <laughs> he's, like, he's like, yeah, Wayne can play anything. He would be like this. Uh, <laughs> it's <just laughs> it's a, awesome. It's so, no, it's know. like the coolest thing. Yeah. But th that my point is that those Japan tapes, yeah. we still reference those. He still makes us go back and reference those live videos because there are certain elements that we've been pulling from. I, I would like you answered all the, my questions. I was gonna ask you for a memorable moment, but you've already hit on so many of them. Yeah, yeah. Does anything else stand out to you? I mean, you play, but well, all the icons. Like, well, I guess, I guess you know, one memorable moment is when I met Miles and I started working with him. Wow. You know, which was based on Back in Stride. Ah. Uh -huh. Frankie Beverly and Mays. Yeah. Right. Because I, I came up with the horn part on there. You know, the, the intro goes. Back in stride. That's you. Uh, yeah. Ooh. So anyway, my, Miles heard that song and he heard my horn line, you know. Now he wrote a song called Maze based on my horn line. Really? Yeah, so I went to a concert at the Beverly Theater yeah. and met Miles. And I told him, I said, yo, because you know, his nephew Vince and Michael. Michael White, the drummer from Maze, with yeah, yeah, friends yeah. from Chicago. And that's how I knew the story. And so I told him, I said, yo, I heard that you wrote this song called Maze based on my horn line. Yeah, yeah. You wrote that? I said, yeah. Write me something. Gave me his number. Next thing you know, I'm at his house and we're working together and I'm like, so, so I wrote a lot of stuff for him and went in the studio on, on what they call now the rubber band sessions. Matter of fact, they just released some of the wow. stuff that we did last year. But some of the other stuff that I wrote hasn't been released. Some of the stuff, matter of fact, one of the songs that's on my album is called Bookends. And uh, that was written for him. He told me to write him something in six. So I wrote that for him. And then did a National Public Radio documentary where they actually went to his rehearsal for the first time. 
Danny Glover hosted it. And then one of my boys called me. And it's like, yo, man, Miles is on the radio talking about you. And I said, what? So anyway, Miles is on there just imitating me. He's like, listen to my friend Wayne. He always does this, you know. And he starts, you know, except they, they call me Ziggy, you know, because I do that. You know, Ziggy, like a black and get a little like a You know, that's my thing. So anyway, but anyway, so Miles is imitating me. And then they're rehearsing my song, you know, and it's called Wayne's, it's called Bookends, but on his albums it's called Wayne's Tone. So I, I, meet, I, I see Carlos Santana and he's like, I know you he, everybody thinks Wayne Shorter wrote it, you know, because he ended up dying when the shit was released and they didn't have my credits and my publishing and all that was jacked up, you know, so I had to go back and fix all but that. But you got it rectified. Yeah, yeah, but okay. still, I mean, you know, yeah. it's a nightmare, you know. Oh, man. Yeah. Dude, what, what, I mean. Yeah, so that was, you know. We hit, uh, you can't hit any more <laughs> high points, bro. Yeah. Yeah, it was Stevie Wonder. We didn't Steve, talk about oh, Stevie. we didn't talk about Stevie. No, that was another You've been working one. with Stevie for a while, though. Yeah, well, my, my ex-wife, Lynn. Yeah. Did the Hotter Than July tour and in Square Circle. That was like 85. Wow. When she started. Then she introduced us in 87. So I've been playing with him since then. And I first toured with him in 93. Although in 87, they had my name in the tour book because I was asking him, could I go? I was like, you need to take me with you because you need to have some funk That's awesome. behind you. So I was yeah. like, am I going? He was like, come by the studio. We'll talk about it. Yeah. Randy Crawford had asked me to go with her. Wow. And I was stalling to accept to see whether he wanted me to go. <laughs> and so he didn't tell me I, that I was going. So I took her gig. And next thing I know, when I ran into them in London, because yeah. we both were touring London, they had the tour book with my name in it as keyboard player. That's hilarious. Because they thought I was going to go. So I didn't go then. <laughs> and I later went in 93. But, but it came back around. Yeah, well, I'm going to say we were, we were always more friends than, okay. than work, because like I said, I met him. She just introduced us as keyboard players. That's just so I wasn't in this band. Now. Yeah. So I was like, you know, and that's kind of how I've maintained my... But see, that's good, yeah. Yeah, you know what I'm saying? It's like, so he's my boy, you know what I mean? Yeah. I work for him sometimes, but not all the time. Yeah. And that's one of the reasons, because, you know, I don't like how a lot of shit be going on sometimes. And I'm like, no. Like, after I toured in 93, I was like, okay, you got to pay me more money. Right, all right. You know, yeah. this isn't enough. Sure. Not for Stevie Wonder, you know. Yeah. So I stayed home yeah. after that. That's one of my questions. <laughs> That's one of the only ones I didn't get to. Yeah. When to say no? And you, yeah. just, you just yeah. laid it out. Like when I quit Mays, you know, they offered me the gig to go out with the Jones girls or whatever. And they were opening up for Mays. I'm like, I can't quit Mays and then go on the road to open up for Mays. What kind of shit is that? <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? That's not a good look. No, so no, I, can't, I had to turn it down. You yeah, know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Some things you just say no to, you know. Right. But, but it stems that goes back to that confidence. Yeah. You have that confidence in that in yourself. Yeah, and you're willing to, to pay the cost. And, and you talk about that. You know what I'm yeah, Sometimes I mean, that, it, it'll get dry, right? Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? It might not be the finance, you know, financially. I got, I could have used the money yeah. when I didn't take the Jones girls because when I quit Mays, I just basically quit because I was like, I want to do more me. You know, I mean, I didn't have a real, real... I was doing George Howard at the time. You okay. know, I was writing for him and producing shit on him. Yeah. I just uh, I just felt like I just basically just quit out of the blue. Nah. You know what I mean? But I still maintained a good relationship with Frank. Yeah. So I did all the records. Yeah. Even after I left the band. So the Can't Get Over You and Silky Soul and oh, all that yeah. I'm on, you know. Wow. Uh, you know, all the stuff he did. Laid back, girl, you know. One thing we didn't talk about yeah, tell me. Well, that we started talking about is my my uh, my youngsters. Uh, you know what I mean? Yes. And Your I was mentor saying, program. Exactly. Tell me. Yeah. Well, basically, what I was saying is that, you know, matter of fact, James died back when we were doing the Oscars. Uh -huh. James Ingram and, and Leon Ware, yeah. like I said, both big brothers of mine. Brock Peters is another one of my mentors who's gone. Uh -huh. But anyway, the point is, is that all these older cats, like, poured into me. Mm. You know what I mean? They didn't treat me like I was a kid. They, you know, they saw my talent, embraced me, helped me mm -hmm. learn the ropes, you know, shape me, guide me. Because mm -hmm. I, you know, I've always, you know, been accessible to the youngsters and try mm -hmm. to, you know, guide them and do what I can to, you know, like you said, you know, if I can help you, right. I'm willing to do that, you know. Right. So he told me to formalize them, you know. I like that. So I said, okay. So God put it on me to start a musical family. And that's what I did. So I invited 11 youngsters to come up under my wing. Really? 
And so this is the first time I'm talking about it publicly. Ah, All right. Okay. And so we're called Zig Society. Zig Society. Society. Based on my name. Based on your nickname. And the name came from Teddy and Tina Campbell. So then Teddy called me one day and he said, I, I, I told Tina what you were doing. And she and God, you know God gave us this name. What you think about it, Zig Society? I said, okay, I like that. And I went back to the family and told them about it. But basically, I called them all individually and gave them the invitation, and I explained to them what we are and who we are. And one thing I told them, I said, is that what I want to bring to you guys is something that doesn't exist really in LA music business, and that is love for what we do. Mm. You know, I said, we, you know, it turns into a financial thing. Financial stress. I said, but I want, I said, we all pick these instruments up because we love to, to do it. You know, we used to leave high school or elementary school and go to somebody's house and just fucking and play. jam for hours in the with, basement. Right, with no garage. money. Hours. You feel no me? Money. Because we love it. I used to tell my guys, bring a bag lunch because we ain't leaving this that's basement. That's right. You feel me? We're staying And see, that's here. how we did it. Yeah. So I said, I want to introduce that back into what we're doing. I said, so right. inside our family, the core family, because there is the core family, then there are other Zig Society, too, who don't perform with Zig Society. Okay. You know what I'm saying? Because I'm not just saying I'm only going to help 12 kids. Sure, sure, sure. And they're not kids. Yeah. You know, they're grown people. Okay, they're yeah. working musicians, MDs. <laughs> you know, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. They band. Yeah. But uh, anyway, so... Uh, I said, inside the core family, we don't charge each other. I said, so if you need drums on a track, you send it to a drummer in the family. When you need a guitar, you send it to our guitarist. You need keys, you send it to me or one of the others. You know, so therefore you don't spend your church money trying to get a demo done. Oh, an idea. You know, so that's one thing we do. Then I say, then we have family days where we come to my studio in my house and then we just play together. And we can do all kinds of things. We can pass the baton where you got 30 minutes with the band. You got an idea you want us to play. We just record it. Whatever we do, we hang out, we play. Then I take them in. Then I give them tutorials on reading music. And then I take them through my video library and I show them some old footage like Stevie's rehearsal in 93 or 89 at Radio City with Aretha Franklin and Whitney Houston the first time I met her with... Paul Mooney and, and people opening up for us, you know, all this footage I got. For Paul Mooney, the, the comedian. Yeah, he was, this is, you know, and I got, it's funny, I'm like this little, I mean, I'm like, I'm, you know, I was a kid, so yeah, I was yeah. a little guy. But I got all this footage, you know. And uh, so I show him some of that, you know what I mean? I talk to him about stuff we're talking about. Now, basically, yeah. I'm bridging the gap between them and me and my generation okay. and the generation before me. So basically, right. like you said, what you were asking me about earlier, the lineage between the history of this city yes. and these new guys who were just moving into town with right. no connection to what's come before. Right. You know what I mean? So my goal is to create that link, you know what I'm saying, between the stuff that I did, you know what I mean, you I know, playing it. with Jameson Jr. And, you know, <laughs> and the sessions, you know what I mean, I the stuff it. that I yeah. do, the stuff that I know, you know. Uh, my history, my life experience. So I want them to have, see, I'm 57 and cats are dying. You know what I mean? And I'm not taking it with me. And I don't want to. I, I want to share, I wanna share pass it. The baton. You know what I'm saying? Oh. So they have benefits of what I know. And uh, so anyway, we've had two family days so far. The first really? family day. I'm going to let you hear. This is exciting. Oh, it's exciting. I want to be involved some yeah. way, somehow. Yeah, you can. I want us to join yeah. like forces some yeah. way, somehow. Well, the thing is, whatever I can do, you, you know, we me. got we got a bunch of stuff. And we, you know, it's funny too. Uh, once we started, I thought I was like, you know what? I want to document this. I want to do a documentary on, yes. on what I'm doing with these kids. Yeah. And oddly enough, one of my good friends that I ran into at James's funeral, we reconnected, and he uh, started watching me on Instagram, mm. and he called me, and uh, he pitched to me. He's like, I want to do a, a film about yes. you. And I was like, it's funny that you would say that. I said, because I'm looking for somebody to do a film about Zig Society. So, you know, right now we're, uh, you know, gearing up for that. Amazing. And uh, he and I have already had our initial meetings. And so we're going to do that documentary. Amazing. Right. But the family, though, it's, it's, it's ridiculous. I have two drummers, two bassists, two keyboard players. Yeah. Right now only one guitarist. But I'm yeah. going to put out one more invitation. I think we need two guitars. Yeah. And uh, I have two vocalists and then my two kids. 
Oh, wow. Because my son's a gospel rapper and my daughter's a singer. I met your daughter on the Capitol Jazz with Lynn. Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. So sweet, uh -huh. so kind. So you were there with, was Kennedy on the show? Was it? Was, yeah, yeah, uh -huh. we were on the show with Face. Right. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, nice, yeah, yeah. nice. I wanted to tell you that. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah so she's in Kanye's That's choir too. She's been working, oh, you know. Wow. She's, she's doing quite well. Good. So anyway, the first day, I just had a meet and greet. Yeah. Because they didn't know each other, all of them. Right, right. Oh, and wow. uh, so they came over. What a surreal experience. It was crazy, you know. And they were all excited. It's funny, they were all excited. Yeah. You know, they was like, you know, and they called me Uncle Wayne. You know, that's why it's funny. Because uh, one of my youngsters is Brandon Brown. He's the musical director oh, for the Jacksons. I love yeah. Brandon. Yeah. Right. So Brandon calls me Uncle Wayne, you know what I mean? So we were out love there with that. the Jacksons. They all. They, they Brandon were, has sat right here. Has he? Yeah, we kicked it here. Yeah, I, Brandon is ridiculous. Podcast. He's beautiful. Yeah, 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 he's a great and guy. And his band, the BBC. Yeah, yeah. Come on, man, kill it. Yeah. yeah. So anyway, the the, okay. the core is uh, basically Brandon on bass, and then there's Tim Bailey on bass. Okay, I don't know Tim. Tim, uh, he's ridiculous too. He moved yeah. to Vegas though. Okay. He plays in my band when he's sure. here. His brother's doing Marcus's gig on drums. Okay. Alex Bailey. Uh, Marcus Miller? Yeah. Okay, gotcha. And, and nice. he plays his butt off, nice. too. Alex he plays Miller. bass and drum. Okay. But anyway, Tim is the other bass player. Because he, he's born on my birthday. I've been mentoring him for a long time. Nice. So I was like, well, if I'm doing this, I can't do it without Tim. All you right. know, if I'm going to formalize it, I can't leave my original, you know. Cat out of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah you know yeah. what I mean? So he has, he's, he lives in Vegas. So anyway, so it's Brandon and Tim. Then the drummer is Ray Marshall. And Stanley Randolph. Those oh, are the of two. course, I know Stanley. Yeah, yeah. Right. Well, Ray Marshall, he just went out with this guy John Boolean or something, hmm. this rapper or something. But he's okay. he's a youngster. Yeah. I just ran. He's been doing my gig too. Nice. All of them, I said, they all of them are youngsters to me because you know. Yeah. I've been doing this that long, you know. So then the keyboard players is this guy named Q Smith, Quentin Smith. Okay. And he actually produces both of my kids. He's the, I met him because he does their records. Okay. And uh, but I didn't know he could play as good as he can. Oh, Every boy can play. Nice. And then the other keyboard player is Dave Jackson. He's Jennifer Hudson's musical director. Okay. Yeah. He, he was playing at West Angeles, but he can play too. Nice. And then uh, the guitarist is Chris Payton. Chris Payton. I know Chris. Yeah. 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 So that's and Keyboard, then the yeah. singers are Emmy Seacrest. You know Emmy. No, I don't know. Well, Emmy. She's a part of the band that was doing the Steve Harvey show. Yeah. She could really go to. Nice. And she's also one of the Sappers, Kanye's group. Gotcha. And then uh, she's she did the, my stepdaughter's wedding with me, but she's, nice. you know, all of them. They, and then Jarrell Quinn. I just met him. Ricky okay. hired him to do class party. Okay. And uh, so I MD class party for Ricky this year because oh, Ricky nice. was busy with the Grammy stuff and then right. another show. So Dave was in my band. Right. Uh, Dave Jackson was playing second keys in the Clive band. Okay. And uh, Jarrell was one of the singers. He also hired my daughter, Lonnie. Oh, she was nice. one of the singers. And so, anyway, I got to know Jarrell, and I so liked him cool. a lot. He can really sing. He's got a great... Also, see, I didn't pick these people just for talent. I picked them for spirit yeah. as well. Because I wanted the right kind of attitude. And chemistry. Yeah. So, uh... That's amazing, Yeah. Man. So I said, so basically, I said, I invited nine of y'all, the last yeah. two. My son and my daughter, y'all. I say y'all don't get a choice. I'm just yeah, telling you what we do. Because you're my kids proxy, already. Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, so the first day was a meet and greet. And we yeah. just kind of kicked it. And then the second day, we had a family day. And everybody was there but three. Yeah. Chris wasn't there. Twiz, Tim, the bass player. And uh, Jarrell wasn't able to come. Yeah. And the rest of it, I had the whole family. I set the studio up with three keyboard stations. Nice. And so they said, well, what are we going to do? I said, well, first thing we're going to do, we're just going to play. She's going to vibe. We're going to play. I ain't going to tell you what we're going to do. We're just going to vibe. So we came up with two different segments, and both of them were 17 minutes long. See? And it's crazy. That's expressive. And then we stopped, had dinner, and talked yeah. trash, and, yeah. you know, had some fun and watched the basketball game. And yeah. Then after that, then I had an idea. I was like, and a lot of men left by then, but I was like, okay, y'all do this for me. So Brandon and Ray and Dave was there. And then one of my other youngsters has a Kaya. He's Zig Society, but he's not performing society. He's like, you know, right, he's under my wing, too. I'm just helping him develop. He's 22, keyboards mm. and drums. Mm. Anyway, he was filming that day. But anyway, he got on one of the synthesizers, and, and he played with us on the last number. That was an idea I had. I'll let you hear all this stuff. It's going to mess you up. It's I like, can't wait, man. Yeah. So anyway, that's, that's Zig Society. Awesome. 
All right, well, that wraps it up for this episode of the Career Musician Podcast with yours truly, Nomad. I want to thank Wayne Lindsay and check it out. Be sure to go listen to his music. Download the CD, stream it everywhere, CD Baby, Spotify, Apple Music, iTunes, blah, blah, blah. It's Wayne Lindsay, a song without words. And trust me, you're going to want to keep this thing on repeat. Wayne's website is waynelindsaymusic.com. That's W-A-Y-N-E-L-I-N-S-E-Y, then the word music.com. And all of his socials can be found from there, his Facebook, his Instagram, etc. Until next time, stay funky, keep jamming, the career musician, R&B, rock and roll, and everything in between. If you enjoyed today's interview, please subscribe and leave a review. I'm just a nomad, nowhere man Writing the songs in this one-man band A nomad Sometime until then, baby, don't you cry. Be Nomad here, host and creator of the Career Musician Podcast, wanting to tell you all about pantheonpodcast.com network. I am a part of this collective that is solely music based podcasts. And guess what? It is the only one of its kind on the globe so far. It is a collective of an independent network of podcasts all based on music, which dig into the culture, technology, history, and everything else you can imagine that has to do with music. Thank you so much for listening, and be sure to check us out at pantheonpodcasts.com.